Well, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 311 of F Stop. Collaborate and listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week, I had a great time speaking with one of my favorite UK photographers, Matt Oliver. Matt's photography has always captured my attention. It's clean, well seen, and quite inviting. I encourage you to browse his gallery while listening to the podcast or watching us on YouTube. Before we start, I wanted to make another plea for your support of the podcast on Patreon. Based on download data, I've calculated that only about 2% of our listeners support the show on Patreon. Of course, I'm incredibly grateful for the 2% of you that have found a way to support the show, including our newest supporters, Michael Salmon, Craig Koppelman, David Alter, Stephen Gingold, Deidre Rosenberg, and Steve Gettle. If you find value in these conversations, your generous support of the show would go a long way in showing that value. As long as you are giving me more than zero dollars, I think it's a fair transaction. For everyone who already is, thank you so much. You're the best, seriously. Please go to patreon.com forward slash f-stop and listen to support the show. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Matt Oliver. All right, Matt Oliver, it's great to have you on the podcast. Hi, Matt. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And it's, uh, yeah, you've had some wonderful guests on the show. Uh, so it's a real privilege, I think. Cause we've certainly had a couple of of, of my favourite photographers on there, um, with particularly uh, Joe Cornish, I think, to, uh, to especially to anybody, a landscape photographer in the UK, I think he's way, way up there on the list of, uh, of legends. Um, and, uh, and William Neal as well. So I feel very privileged to be uh, to be chatting to you this evening. Uh, I mean, I think you're selling yourself a little bit short. I really like your <laughs> your photography is really good. And I hopefully for people that haven't seen your work before, this will be a nice way for them to be introduced to your great photography. That's yeah, very kind. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, maybe that's a great entree into you introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about who Matt Oliver is. Yeah, so, yep, I'm Matt Oliver. I'm a photographer living, born in Derbyshire, now living in Sheffield, which is pretty central, centrally based in the UK. Um, I'm a commercial, my photography life is kind of split down the middle. I'm a commercial photographer, which uh, pays the bills. Uh, but I also enjoy landscape photography, which is which is my real passion. So, um, if it's if it's not too cheesy, I guess one feeds feeds the stomach and one feeds the soul, as such. But uh, I think, it, all seriousness, it's true. I think a lot of photographers and people that enjoy nature, it does it does feed the soul. So it's a good balance, you know, to my day to day work. What's your uh, what is your commercial work typically about? So we we predominantly shoot for websites, brochures, magazines. It's all commercial advertising product work. Um, predominantly do a lot of room set photography um, ah. uh, and, and product photography, all, pretty much all studio based. Um, very now and again, we'll go out on location, but yeah, it's, I would say 90% is now it's studio based work. Okay. And how long have you been doing photography? Too long to care to remember. It's probably, <laughs> I've been self-employed for 23 years um, and so probably pushing 35 years in total since leaving college. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting on a little bit now, so <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been a while. Okay. And married, kids, no kids? Uh, yes, yeah, so I live with my partner and my four-legged son, which is a hairy mutt called Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we've not not got any kids, but yeah, so yeah, it's just just the three of us uh, living in yeah in Sheffield. All right. Well, and so I've never been to the UK, so tell us a little bit about what your area looks. Um, so I live just outside the Peak District, it's probably the baby. What you you would call it the baby of of the UK landmarks, I guess. So you've got, I mean, there's there's, there's lots and lots of places. But um, you've got Scotland, which is the grandest of the landscapes, probably. Then the lakes. 
you've got the, the Yorkshire Moors, but then the, the Peak District is, is not quite on the scale of those. But I think what it makes up for is, is the accessibility, which comes with its own problems because it does get incredibly busy. Uh, so I, I like to get out sort of early or later in the evening to sort of enjoy the, the more quiet spots. But so, so it's it's very it's very accessible with a lot of human activity in the landscape. So um, that that basically forms forms the, the shapes of the of the land. There are many grit stone edges, uh, lots of woodlands. So yeah, there's loads and loads to sort of sort of enjoy, even though it's in a relatively small area. Gotcha. Okay. Well, before we get back into talking about all about that stuff, I would love for you to tell us how you got into photography to begin with. Yeah, sure. So it probably all started around about when I was at school, around about 15. I had sort of a, an obsession with trying to work out uh, what I wanted to do with a career at, a, at an early age, which I suppose is a little bit strange. Um, and you, I kind of you kind of dwell on why that was. I think it probably came from the fact that my, my folks split up when I was quite young. So I then developed a prob probably an independence to know what I wanted to do, you know, to, to kind of look after yourself, look, looking back on that. Mm. And I don't know if it's the same in the U in the US, but we would get um, be let loose with some work experience through secondary school. So I use that as an ex as an experiment to sort of try possible career paths uh, and I quickly find out the various things that I did weren't quite what I wanted to pursue. And I, <laughs> I, was, I, get, I guess I was starting to get a little bit worried about, you know, I was approaching the end of secondary school uh, and what, what career I would take. And in my last sort of year and a half, I, for my GCSEs, uh, I, I branched into art and design. Um, I was desperate to sort of be able to paint and draw but unfortunately i just i just don't have that talent i mean i'm so impressed <laughs> me neither so impressed by... <laughs> he's, he's so i'm so impressed but that anybody that can put pen or, or brush to paper and just create something i mean it's 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 fantastic but yeah unfortunately i just i don't possess that that talent but in the classroom right at the back of the room there was a, a basically a cupboard and it was a dark room and I'm not sure how or why we branched off into this, but there were three of us that decided that we could not that none of us could paint or draw. So <laughs> we opted we opted to you know to check out this dark room. So I was pretty naive really in terms of photography. I mean, I I, I used an Instamatic camera as a kid, you know, just taking family snaps, but but nothing particularly any, anything else at that age to do with photography. Uh, so so yeah, we 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 would get a camera. We'd be sent out around the school grounds, take really, really bad pictures, uh, get them, get them developed, and then the following week we'd be we'd spend time in the dark room. And I think I think I think I've heard you mention that you've done so you've done printing in the past, and I know anybody that's um, that, that's tried black and white printing, I think will know this will know the feeling is I think at, at that age at fifty and you're into this this incredibly red world with all these strange smelling chemicals it's 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 brilliant it's a, it's like a whole new world for you and the negatives into the larger it, it sprays down the image onto the board and i think once you expose that first piece of paper and into the tray and see it appear it blew my mind it was like it was like a light bulb moment for me right I thought, you're like whoa yeah, definitely. It was like, well, I thought, you know, this this is something I want to pursue as a career. And it was just at that age, it was then trying to work out how, you know, how to pu push that forward. Um, and this this was approaching end of my school time. Um, and I basically then went, left home and went to Sheffield for two years to study uh, HND um, and then moved on to art college in a place called Dewsbury. Um, and this this was a, a high national diploma. And it was a very much a commercial based uh, course, which was great really, because we got hands on with uh, five, four cameras, uh, flash equipment in a studio environment. We, we would go to the stores. I mean, 
we were using medium they were medium format cameras so we had Hasselblad's uh, the Rolleiflex nice. twin lens I know at the time I just didn't appreciate how beautiful these cameras were you know it's sure you were just you using them just really badly but you know, to, have the ex <laughs> <laughs> to have the experience now looking back at what we what we were allowed to use it was fantastic uh, so then so yeah that was a further two years studying which then led me on to to produce a portfolio in a just huge AO flip folder. I mean, there was there was no form of sort of digital uh, ways of, of of showing a portfolio back then. I think this was around 90, 96, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was armed with this folio, left college, very naively thinking I would walk into a job, but spent sort of the next eight months knocking on any door of any studio, just trying to get an interview and a foot in the door kind of thing. And yeah, it's pretty difficult. Um, you know, it's probably down to my poor work that I wasn't getting <laughs> getting, in, getting anywhere. But um, eventually, I did manage to uh, get an opportunity at a studio in Nottingham, uh, and it was it was really poor pay. Um, <laughs> I worked for it's I think it's about fifty quid a week. I think my boss pretty was, was drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like a tough, tough environment, um, and he, he, you know, he worked us really hard. It was probably, we were probably, sort of twelve-hour days. But oh wow, you were so, I, I was so glad to sort of get an opportunity in a career that I wanted to pursue. You, I would just do anything really, right? And it, it was, it was actually a really good experience because eventually I kind of learned the ways of business through his business. So I was making the mistakes, you know, not not. Not without the such. without the risk without exactly yes without the risk yeah no it's brilliant but the the what the, i guess the one thing uh, was that he was he was one of the first digital photographers uh, in the uk at that time so it was a brilliant opportunity in that respect um from, from learning in the ground up it was i think he it was a leaf digital back um which i think eventually sort of amalgamated into into phase eventually he, he went to oh. Imicon color color crisp and it was this huge uh, the size of a brick that bolted onto the back of a, a fuji gfs body that was built like a tank and then on the front of this there was a giant uh, dinner plate size filter wheel that shot uh, a red green and a blue exposure then combine them together to give you this te <laughs> wow. a, a 10 megapixel file you know it was, it was it was pretty 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 basic for the cost that he, he outlaid i think it was something like with all the mac mac equipment back then it was something like 80 grand right, right. 000, you know it was it, it was really expensive stuff but yeah it was it was a it was a great opportunity in that respect for because the digital was just sort of in its early days and we i was kind of in there learning learning from the ground up so yeah it was in that respect it was a great opportunity so earlier you you talked about how the the commercial work feeds feeds the belly <laughs> and <Yeah>. the <laughs> landscape work feeds your soul um and i think that's a fairly common approach to photography these um but yes. i know a lot of people that do that or that come go full-time or super worried about their professional obligations kind of tainting their passion and i'm curious how you've found a balance between those two yeah that's the difficult thing isn't it um i think in my early days of setting up the business back at back in 2000 i think all my energies went into into building into building that um so landscape photography did take a bit of a back seat for a while there until until that started to get a little bit of a foothold and probably, yeah, it was probably about 2010 when I started to take landscape photography a bit more seriously. Um, and, and then, yeah, it's then once, once you, I'm sure you know, Matt, once, once the bug bites, it's, it becomes a bit of an obsession. So then it is finding that balance of, you know, how can I get, how can I get more, more time to, to enjoy it? But I think because I don't earn a living from landscape photography, then the pressure is not so great it's difficult isn't it because you don't, take it, you don't want to take it for granted because it's a it's a privilege to be go, to be able to go out and take pictures so in that respect 
I think whenever you can get out, you do you do make the most of it. Um, in terms of commercial work, it is it's it's quite it's quite a stress stressful environment, um, and landscape is is zero stress really. So mm. yeah, that balance that balance it balances each other out. I think. Um, have you ever so yeah. have you ever wished that you could fully sustain yourself just with like? Um, I do wonder that. Yes, um, but then would I think sometimes that would remove. The, the pleasure of of of, of having that um, stress free environment, having to earn a living from it, because I think it does change everything, doesn't it? Um, if you're under pressure to earn money, things change, and probably, yeah, I'm sure I've, people sort of suggest that that then becomes the job. Um, right. And landscape, yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to try as as I get older. Um, I'm trying to balance it the other way. I think we do, we, we, we trial a four day week now. So it gives me a bit of extra time in trying to, in, you know, in, into getting out. And I think I also live much closer now to, to the Peak District. So opportunities are much more, uh, much of are there much more just to get out and, 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 enjoy, and enjoy it more. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's been the huge benefit for me is, you know, I purposely chose where I live because it's close to the desert and it's close to the mountains and, you know, within anywhere from 30 minutes to three hour drive, I can be in some of the best landscapes in the United States. So, yeah, but it comes at a cost, you know, cause it's expensive to live here and things like that. I'm curious if that's kind of similar for you as well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's by, it's, it's by fate, I guess, rather than design, um, through death, divorce, and things like that. My okay. life changed um, from where I was living previously, which I wasn't a million miles away from from the Peak District. Um, but I mean, I've I've always had an obsession an obsession with with this area, and it was a dream really to live close close by. But like I say, just through circumstance. Um, I've moved much closer so yeah it's I'm probably now sort of 10 or 15 minutes away which, which nice. does allow me to get to, to get out there much more yeah that's awesome <laughs> that's super cool yeah. so I'm curious how does the commercial work help you become a better landscape photographer and vice versa well I think I both the both cross over into each uh, each, each discipline crosses over into learning different things so i've learned a lot from sort of, sort of mistakes in each um process uh, i think f certainly i think the biggest thing is sort of simplification um so in, in terms of landscape photography it's it's very much what we keep out of the frames is, is as important as as what's in is what, what's in the frame um and that but both cross over there in terms of in terms of that aspect and where commercial work has influenced uh, where landscape has influenced my commercial work is, is just through observing light more than anything else mm. um, so in probably in my early days in commercially I thought a solution to a problem was to to add light to the subject so we do a fair bit of room set photography so I would I would end up with seven or eight lights trying <laughs> to right. light a scene so <laughs> I thought you know and you'd, it would get, you'd get really confused. Um, whereas since I've taken landscape photography more seriously, just, just from observing, observing light, uh, and obviously there's only one light source within, right. within the landscape. I then br I brought that into, into room set photography so that I can light a room set now with, with one or two lights and a ton of reflector boards. Uh, and that it has a much more natural feel. It's much, easy to easy to light and that, that the result is far superior so yeah it certainly helped you know in that in that regard and probably takes a lot less time to set up <laughs> absolutely yeah it, yeah i used to get wrapped up in circles because you just keep adding lights to try and solve a problem and you know, right. just wouldn't fix it <laughs> yeah and yeah. sometimes simplifying is such an easy solution but it often over Definitely, yeah. I think, in terms of landscape photography, I like I like to have complex complex 
S simplify complexity is kind of the way of thinking about it. So I, I'd like the viewer to, to, to see something that has interest in terms of shape, uh, composition and colour. But, but I like to keep it simple and, and that goes back to sort of managing your edges of your frame um, and keeping, you know, keeping what, what's in the frame interesting without showing too much. I think going back to the paint painting analogy, it's p painters add to the scene and it's knowing when to, when to stop, whereas a photographer would, it's all about subtraction and knowing and knowing when, you know, when enough's enough. Yeah, spot on. I just did a critique session with Tim for NLPA entries from last year. And like, that was probably the recurring thing that came up over and over and over again is that the images that didn't do as well is because they added, there's too many distracting elements that were included in the frame that should have just been eliminated from the start. Yeah. And, and it takes time. I mean, I'm still learning very much that, that process. Um, oh, and still... for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and it's. It, my, I would suggest that my images aren't perfect at all yet, um, but that's. I think in my mind that's where I try to aim for, um, and that's the basis of sort of the of, of my photography is trying to get to that that point. But it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, I'm curious when you're in the field, and you're setting up a composition. What's your approach to trying to distill it down to the most important things to include or exclude from? I think a lot a lot of it is a repetition of going to places over and over um i think in the in a, if you're looking at a wider scene that's certainly the case i struggle to go to a brand new location and and get a shot first time and i, I might get lucky um but but by, by revisiting locations and practicing sort of compositions that i that i think might work i think that 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 helps narrow that down to to, perfect, to, to more to what I'm trying to look for. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you go to woodland photography, then I think it, it's just observation and just taking taking time just to, just to wander through a, a location. Um, yeah, and, and I think you've got to immerse yourself a little bit more in in woodland to, 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 to distill the chaos down into 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 more of an interesting picture. How, how often are you using the crop tool in in camera or just or, generally or in post all the all the time yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> I th it's i think i saw a discussion recently saying that it's it's a bad thing to do but personally oh god it i, I it's probably the, the most important tool in in camera or in in lightroom or photoshop um i mean i've i think so, i don't know if you're the same I've taken pictures and the, obviously there's something I've seen at the time, but then I've got back to the computer, looked at the, looked at the file and just dismissed it, the uh, non-starter. But then maybe m months later, re-looking with fresh eyes, I've seen the shot within the shot that I saw at the time. And it's, it's, cr it's that crop that, that helps me find that. Yes. And, that and, and that's a huge learning curve for me as well, because... It's, it's, I'm not skilled enough to see it at the time, but I've seen something within the scene. And then it's just months later that then I finally visualize it. Or you, or you did see it, right? And you're like, oh, that'll be an easy crop. And then when you get home and you go to edit it, yeah. you've totally <laughs> forgot that that's what you're going to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pro I do that all like the time. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I the other day, well, not the other day, maybe like six months ago, I was revisiting some photos I took in fall here in 2018. And, and I did the same thing. I was like, why didn't I ever edit this photo? If I just yeah. crop, it's actually really good, you know, and yeah. they just need distance sometimes, you know, from the from from the day you shot it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's just a learning curve again, isn't it? From experience as well as photographers is is working out that that's a big factor in in, in processing and editing is just use the crop tool because you, I'm sure everybody's got images on, on the hard disk drive that just with a simple crop transforms it completely. I, I think some of my favorite pictures now are, are images I dismissed and once I'd worked the crop yeah, I think it just it just you see that you see the, the the image that you saw in the first place. 
Yeah, no, it's interesting that there's a conversation out there that exists that cropping is somehow like bad. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I understand it from a competition perspective to some degree, like if a photographer just cropped like from this to down to this because they're lazy. Yeah. Yes, okay. That's, yeah. that's one thing, but you know, if you're just cropping a little bit to kind of exclude things that are a distraction, I think that's a perfectly acceptable tool. Not definitely. I think it's, I don't think we should limit ourselves to, to rules and have, you know, shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. I think if something works, then why, why not? You, you use the, use it. Exactly. It's not like someone's looking over your shoulder telling you not to do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit, I know you've chosen to live close to the Peak District and I'm curious how important it is for you to be close to your favorite location. It's um, very, very important. I think, I think the Peak District has always been there through, throughout my life. Um, and it's, it's basically sort of a memories and, connect, and connection to place. So I, I used to walk as a kid with, with, with my dad um, and family members. So I've got that, all those memories built up in, in that period of my life. But I'd, I'd had suffered with sort of depression um, and anxiety for most of his life. Um, and he was in and out of sort of the doctors. Um, and he, he, did, he did actually end up taking, taking his life, but, mm. And that, and that, so that this, I've got this real connection in terms of place that way because I hold a lot of special memories, you know, from those times. Mm -hmm. um, and also then through life, moving forward through college, I obviously lived in Sheffield, which I spent time while I was studying there in the Peak District. Um, and now, full circle again, I'm now living in Sheffield, which, as I sort of said before, not not by design as such um through circumstance of life but i now live a stone's throw away from where i used where i used to study which i find a lot of comfort in that and i like i do like the the, the finishing the circling the square or you know closing the loop on that part of my life it's it's quite a comforting uh, thought knowing that I'm, I'm back home to a degree even though i'm not sort of from here so in that respect it's hugely important and then i'm now enjoying um exploring again through the camera and reliving those memories as such mm. um so yeah it's very much gives meaning to my to my life um uh, get, getting out and about with the camera yeah you're good what's what's your approach to photographing a location that's so popular like that like the peak district is in a way that's that's unique to your voice to to the way that you see the so I think, yeah, it's, um, it is important in terms of connection. Uh, for, for, for I think a lot of photographers will, will mention this, that it's being out in nature is, is good for the mind, good for the soul. And that's, that's important for me as well. Um, I do think that having meaning in life is important. Um, and, and the landscape photography is, is, is that to me, um, re retracing my steps. Uh, that I used to walk uh, and relive in the landscape um, and trying to in put my interpretation uh, of, ho of, of home really into pictures uh, and, and, and make the best interpretation of the scenes that I, that I can. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the fact that you have already had such a strong connection to that place growing up there and, and spending so much time there, that that gives you the ability to photograph it in a way that's unique to you. Yeah, I think, I think that's correct. Um, it is all about, it's all about feeling, photographing home. I think, um, I think when you get, you get, you get the boot, you put your boots on and you get, you get out in the environment. Um, and then it's put yeah, I'll like put in my interpretation on, on, on the landscape of, of, of where I live, basically, I think. Yeah. So for, for photographers who are listening that don't live close to their favorite areas, uh, what advice do you have for them to stay engaged 
in photography? I have a little biased opinion because obviously I live, some, I live near somewhere that is is quite good and that's quite local. But I think if it's just a case of of, of, of getting out, exploring, um, and and just pra and practice. I think really is probably the key. Um, I think lockdown did bring home that there is so much beauty on the doorstep. Um, I know from my experience, just just being out and finding paths that I didn't know existed, um, opened opportunities to sort of see see the landscape differently. Um, and these weren't popular hotspots; these were just local would pa pass directly from the door at home. And I think there's so much you can make of scenes like that. Um, just taking time, to sort of observe observe uh, the landscape around us. So I think yeah, probably. It's, it's just just get get yourself out and practice and, and and see what's on the doorstep yeah i love it and you know i feel like it's okay to know i know traveling gets kind of a bad rap with climate change and all that but you know i think if you can get out and experience the world you know i think that every time i come home from a place i've never been to before it helps me see home a little bit differently too if that makes any sense yeah, definitely. I, w I would agree with that. I think we we just we did we did our, a trip to a a trip away to Whitby recently, um, and it was good to see coastal environments. Something that I don't shoot a lot. Yeah. So, and then coming back home, yeah, you you do. I think you do definitely appreciate your environment again, and you do see things differently because you've got such a contrast with right. Yeah. With, with the coast to where I live. And there's certain elements that, that when I was looking, you can bring them, bring that back into your photography at home. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. So shifting gears a little bit again, I mean, I know on your website, you've recently written a lot about curiosity and I'm curious what role curiosity in your, in your advancement as a photographer. Curiosity for me is probably one of the most important factors for, for my learning curve, I think it's kept it's kept my longevity and interest in in photography. That's de definitely it allows us to I think to keep curious allows us to see things that we perhaps pass by um, and just just notice the tiny little details in 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 nature. Um, I think social media can be a bit of a creative killer uh, if we if you know if we allow it to chase chasing likes and things. Um, and photography is very much about peaks and troughs. I think we can we can have a, maybe a purple patch where we're out shooting and everything's good, and we we, we can probably be taking several shots and, and that we're really happy with. But then the, in a in a tr in a trough as such, and they they're probably more. I would say they you have more tr troughs than peaks. I know I certainly do. And that and that can be disheartening. It can it can you can question you, you know how you know am I any good at photography anymore? <laughs> you know when you hit a real low and you're going out time after time and nothing seems to be working. Um, but I think the thing I've learned the most is probably in these times is is just keep is keep going out, um, keep keep having just experiencing the land around us. And I think. I, pr I probably find that I've I learned the most in those times um, that I'm not successful, um, and it's probably a, a subconscious thing, uh, ult ultimately. And then when the conditions are better, I think those practices that you've placed in in those times do help you when the conditions are, are good. Because I think certainly when if you're shooting the wider landscape, when it's good light, it is it's pretty frantic and you know it, it can be you know very frustrating trying to hunt around for a for a composition when the light's fading and just just by practicing in those quieter times can certainly help calm yourself when you when you're in those moments to sort of pull things together and i know that certainly helps me and it's it's also down to that to that re revisiting locations over and over again that that certainly helps and yeah so when 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 you, when you're in a bit of a down patch, I would suggest sort of yeah go go out and explore still and keep keep curious and look at the smaller details um, and yeah ob observe 
try and observe as much as you can because it, yeah it definitely helps yeah i'm i'm actually personally thankful when the conditions sometimes aren't as uh, as good as you expected them to be because i feel like those are the moments when you try to get a little fancy with things you know you're trying to be a little creative with your composition or maybe you try to find something that's not so conditions dependent maybe it's textures or shapes or uh, things like that and that's when you start to develop your toolkit that you can start to apply to other scenes when the when the light is good you know so um, yeah, I think it's absolutely. important to keep shooting through those through those moments. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with you. I think that's that's time for experimentation as well. It's yes. I have I have our drives full of images that probably will never see the light of day. Yeah, but me I too. know that <laughs> <laughs> I know I know that somewhere along the, the along the lines that those images have helped me produce images that I'm I am more pleased with. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Well, you've sort of hinted at this a little bit, but I would love for you to tell us um, about how you would describe your style of photography. Yeah, I think I've, I've often thought about this a lot and I, I'm not sure, it's a difficult one because I'm not sure whether I, I actually have a style as such. Um, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I don't know what you think about that sort of thing, Matt. Um, but I don't, I think there's a lot of disagreement in the landscape photography community that style is even a concept that exists as it relates to our personal work. But yes. if you start to look up like what the definition of style is, it, it starts to make sense because it's like things have a thematic, um, you know, things start to look the same or, you know, if you look at like if you look at someone's photos and you're like, oh, that's that's a that's a Matt Oliver photo, or you look at someone else's photos and it's like, oh, that's a those are I can tell that's a William Neal, you know. Like I feel like that's that's what I what people mean when they say they have a style, you know. Yeah, I think I've, I mean I've got absolute admiration for photographers that that do define a style. I think it takes a lot of dedication to to maybe own a shoot in black and white or only shoot a certain way um, and I, I would in some respects I wish I had I wish I had that but then ultimately I just I just enjoy taking pictures um, I'm the same. And, and I, can't, I think to sort of define myself as either a woodland photographer or, or a lands or a grand landscapes I do I can't really fit into that um, box as such because I enjoy both um, I think and certainly shoot, when you shoot a wide vista, um, I think it's much more em emotive um, and emotional. It's, I think most of my work is probably photographed in, in, in sunrise or sunset. And that's probably because I enjoy being out at those times. I, I do like to see the day start and the day end. I think there's something quite enjoyable about that. Um, and shooting a wide view in those times is quite a joyous experience um, and then if, if you switch to woodland for example I also enjoy that style of photography because that's much more I guess you could say meditative um, contemplate com contemplative that's a word it's taken at much more a, a slower pace um, and you and you can really immerse yourself within that environment conditions tend to last much longer than they do you know when you're out in the wider wider landscape so emotion plays a huge part in my enjoyment of photography in that respect um so i like i like to shoot both ways so in terms of having a style it's, dif it's difficult to say if, if I do or I don't, I'm, I don't personally. I don't think that I do be, because my work is probably varied. You, I guess I a jack of a jack of all trades, you know, rather than a master of one. I'm, I'm not sure, and I I don't know whether that that matters or, or, or at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, I think we're just out to enjoy what we do and enjoy photography and enjoy being outside. And I think limiting putting a limit on that to define a style for me is a is a hard thing to do um, as much as I would like to 
you know ha have a style as such like some of the photographers that i did like i do admire the only risk you take in not developing a very specific style is that um you won't necessarily be like known for something you know what i mean but yeah i don't know i don't i don't take photos to become famous so um so i'm good there yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> I think yeah i think you're probably right there i think it's probably as well if you earn a living from photography full time then maybe that does have to maybe you have to have an identity a bit more i guess yeah potentially potentially um I, mean, I feel like we're both very similar we both enjoy kind of chasing the light and but we also like discovering the smaller scenes too so i'm curious how that kind of multivariate approach has helped you as a photographer yeah definitely i think i think it goes back to the curiosity thing with the smaller scenes um chase chasing light is 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 frantic it can be disappointing um you can get let let down a lot i think i've been a lot <laughs> I, I, yeah <laughs> i've stood i've stood in so many locations and observing light two miles away thinking hey, i should be in that location and it's yeah it's so you know it can be really frustrating but but i think if you when you observe and, and the curiosity again is into the smaller scenes you can really enjoy the photography in a, in a slightly more relaxed manner and i think yeah i agree it's a it's, it's a good way to work yeah i i really enjoy it um it's kind of my go-to now is i'll do both on any given day and typically what that means is you're able to come home with something that you at least sort of like yeah, definitely. I think as well on those on those days where conditions perhaps that don't lend themselves to what we would class as, you know, good good light. I think sometimes I think personally as well, I've found small intimate scenes, um, you know, you know, in 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 that period, um, just just looking at maybe a, a decaying log or you know moss moss or lichen on a boulder these these little scenes pop out when the light is what you would I, hate, I don't want like to call it less bland but um but in the in those less dramatic moments i think as personally as, as a photographer I think in my development anyway those those are the scenes that i enjoy shooting as well because it is it is more a slower pace and you are you you, you are more immersed you know in the environment that you're wandering through yeah, yeah and I, definitely and i feel like to execute those types of photos a photographer is kind of forced to bring a little bit more of themselves to, to yeah, the... yeah definitely because i think they're individual aren't they they're not you are let you are more likely to find something perhaps a little bit more unique and like you say to your that's created by your own vision than maybe in in the inner wider landscape that's probably been taken before Right. Um, so yeah, to, to, to put your mark on something like that is is probably more enjoyable. I want, I'm not sure whether it's easier. Um, but, oh, it's yeah, not easier. It's, <laughs> no, <laughs> but certainly more en enjoyable. I, th I think I think sometimes do we do we look to, to more to those images for that personal connection in in our work uh, because be, purely because they are more more unique to to us, um, and that's. It may not be a crowd pleaser, but I think in, se in terms of self-satisfaction, then yeah, I think I would agree with you in, in that respect. Yeah. And I know you talked a little bit about this already, but um, you know, when the conditions aren't what you expected, I don't know about you, but sometimes it kind of affects me psychologically in terms of like you have all these high hopes and then, oh, this, oh, Dashed. I yeah so i'm curious if that happens to you as well absolutely yeah pretty much 90 percent of the time i go out <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah it's i mean i've stopped i've stopped really checking sort of weather forecasts uh, i mean i used to plan to the ninth degree i'd i'd wake up early check the check out the window see what the clouds are doing should right. i go should i not go um and only to get get there after you know an hour's walk to be completely you know disappointed because the cloud bank rolled in right um so yeah the these days i just i just head out to be to be honest um i think <laughs> and think 
living close to the location does help with that um, because I take Ralph my dog comes out with me so at the end of the day it's a walk if if nothing else um, so, so if conditions don't quite live up to expectation I've, I've, I've it's not a missed opportunity as such um, and I think just I think just going out like we've said previously it, it, there's never a wasted opportunity because I think there's always something that we can that we can learn or visualize or see that we perhaps didn't see before because we're rushing to the location to, to chase that light um, so there's yeah I think we can, we can there's a lot to sort of learn from the disappointments yeah I think that's accurate changing the subject a little bit but you know I've I've been thinking about this particular aspect of landscape photography a lot lately and I think um, I'm quite happy by the fact that optimal optimal conditions are actually pretty rare because I feel like you know it makes it so special when it does happen um, and so I'm curious if you feel the same way and if so how does that impact your approach to photography and perhaps in um, I think yeah I think it's a, it's a similar sort of aspect to the previous uh, question I think if, if conditions happened all the time I think we'd be I think we take it for granted so much and then I don't think the enjoyment would be there so yeah the fact that conditions are, are rare when what, what we would class as, as good good conditions makes it more enjoyable when you hit them um, in terms of editing I don't I don't overly edit my pictures as such um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of overemphasize anything in terms of trying to add something that isn't there uh, I, I would generally, apart from sort of the general contrast uh, and luminosity, I, I, that's that kind of would be my edit. I mean, I don't know how you feel about that that sort of situation. Well, I mean, I've definitely in the past have fallen into the mental trap of feeling like I've I've, I've spent so much time and energy and probably literally money, gas money to yeah. get to a location or maybe you've traveled a long distance and then you go to the scene that you had in mind and then the conditions aren't good and the photograph you had in mind isn't possible but oh you could rescue it if you just swapped the sky or you know did something like that but i feel like the reason why i don't do that kind of stuff um anymore is because i feel like it just kind of cheapens the whole experience like the whole package of looking back at that photo and remembering how incredible it was to to witness that event and if every single photograph looks like it, it was an amazing time but it wasn't i think i would start to get really kind of bored with it i guess i don't know yeah that's absolutely yeah absolutely right i think we would we would get bored with it if it, if it was so regular and, and and that is the excitement of not knowing what the can what the conditions will be like uh, i think there's and if if it is disappointing i mean that's the beauty of photography isn't it there's always there's always the next time and i think that's that's the most enjoyable part of of not knowing what what you'll find when you get to the location regardless of the the hundreds and hundreds of disappointments we've experienced prior to that you know moment right right i mean I feel like there's so many correlations in other parts of our life, you know, like good food, good movies, good TV shows, um, good sex. I mean, if if you've never had a bad sexual experience, like how do you know if you have a good one, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing with an amazing photograph too. I feel like it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spot on. Um, well, you heard it here first, sex is like photography, okay. <laughs> um so totally totally shifting gears um how has photography changed since you've been doing it and what's better and what's um i think in terms of landscape photography obviously i think it's become it's become much more popular in terms of social media um exposure so that has its good and it's bad uh, equations to it i think i've I wouldn't be talking to you today i don't think without sort of that social media aspect um and also i've met quite a lot of people through social media that i wouldn't have met previously um so that's certainly a positive aspect to the way photography's changed um commercially 
there are lots of um I think it's changed it has changed more recently in quite a rapid um pace i think the introduction of ai is quite a big factor i think going forward commercially and um in in landscape photography it's very much sort of a hot topic at the minute isn't it um in in respect of we, we question now some some images um and i think that's is that possibly dis, dis, a little bit disappointing in terms of landscape photography i don't know what you think about oh i i just wrote a whole, whole article in npn about ai and landscape photography um yeah i think the good news is is that at least right now ai photos at least to the trained eye ai is pretty obvious um, I don't think we've gotten to the point yet where AI can necessarily replace natural images, but I think what they can have the ability to do is um, draw attention away from more natural photography, like because they can, you know, they they're so flashy and so interesting that it, yes. you know they they occupy people's attention more readily than perhaps a more natural, intimate scene from the woodlands might be able to. So in terms of commercial work, I'd be super curious to hear your thoughts on how AI is going to have an impact on your business. I think, it, I mean, it, I would say even in the last six months, the the the, the quality of, of, it, of the AI has expanded at quite a rapid pace. Um, and I mean, we, we start to use 3d a lot more in our commercial work so we would we build we build particularly like a kitchen set we would create that now in 3d rather than sort of building that in reality because for one thing there's a huge cost saving and also there's no material waste anymore so that they were so expensive to build in reality in 3d now it's, it's a much more flexible solution i mean you can basically you're limited by your imagination to a degree with all the, with all the quality and build you can put into the image in terms of fixtures and, and fittings so that is a form of ai i guess the 3d but it's created by an operator um so in the future is ai going to replace product product creation i suppose i mean at the rate that it's going i think probably it will do um and and possibly will it be in, in my lifetime as a, as a as a working photographer i'm not i'm not sure but the pace the pace that it, it is gathering it's it's quite frightening actually that the possibilities that, that that it could that it could end up uh, to create um i do agree that at the moment it's it's not anywhere near up to scratch because you can kind of spot them and i think there is a place in terms of landscape photography for, for artists creating work in AI, but I think as I think as long as it's, as it's distinguished in that way, is 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 that a problem? I'm uh, I'm not so sure because will will there be a kickback f from from photographers eventually? I, I guess similar, you could you could relate it to um, like painting painting classical painting, where I mean I, I quite admire. Uh, scenes that have been painted in real exquisite detail so like a stormy sea with a with a ship that's you know in, in dramatic light and when painters created those images that were very realistic and dramatic and then um photography came, photography came along and they were like oh well now what do we do because the camera can create these scenes as such and that's where you know the other movements of, of painting came in so would, will there be a similar a similar situation in terms of AI, because I think as humans, create creative arts are the one thing that that do ground us and also give us a lot of pleasure. And I think sometimes with AI, that then removes that human connection to to the art that's created by the person. Um, yeah, it's so, interesting. So that, have you have you used it? I had a go in the one called Mid Journey. Yeah, um, I've, I actually bought a subscription just so that I could write this article, so I could really get my hands dirty in it <laughs> and it's fun it's a lot of fun i mean i didn't feel like i was some kind of artistic genius or anything like that but 
it's it was really fun you know like uploading my photos and then like blending them together into different photos and it's it's interesting what it produces but i didn't i didn't necessarily feel like i could take credit as an artist um but that's that's me i feel like your your analogy about painting and photography is really relevant because when i think about painting um if i saw a painting um, I'm sure you've seen some of them where like, it's like a human's, like a person and you can't even tell that it's a painting, Yes. but it is a painting yeah. to me. Yeah. That's like, holy crap. That's an incredible skill. Yeah. That's really. amazing. Right. And so like photography didn't necessarily replace that as a skill or, at, or nor, nor did it eliminate our ability to appreciate it for what it really is. And I think that's the thing that it often gets lost in these conversations when I'm talking about it with people is, at least for me, when I know what it is, it helps me articulate or appreciate it in a different way. For example, knowing that that's a painting and not a photograph, I have way more respect for it and appreciation for yes. it than if it's a photograph. And, vice, and on the same lines, if I know something is AI, and not a photograph, I have way less appreciation for it. Even if it's quote unquote better art, art like it looks better, has more aesthetic appeal, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't check the same boxes for me in terms of me appreciating. Yeah, definitely. I think my partner uh, came across an image on Instagram um, and it was an amazing sort of dramatic sea, 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 sea scene. And she was like, wow, this is amazing. It's incredible. And then she read down in the description that it was like AI. She's like, what's this? And it, you know, and as soon as she found out exactly what it was, it, a whole mood towards the picture changed, which I thought was quite interesting from, from somebody that's not particularly involved in that sort of in photography as such. So I think you're exactly you're right. I think once, once you realize how things are created, then perhaps the shine is, is, is removed a little bit because of that, the skill that's involved in a painting or, or a photograph or a photograph for example so yeah I think I, I mean I had, a, I had an experiment with the mid journey and again I completely agree it was great great fun um, and I was blown away with the quality that you could that it was producing but I think I did soon quite get get bored of it because like you I didn't really feel like I was actually creating anything personally um, so yeah, it's 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 a, it's a difficult one where it's where where it is going forward, but I think it it will have consequence um, for commercial work. Yeah, especially um, if you're in the business of uh, like creating storyboards or you know like helping a company imagine what something is going to look like through photography. AI can do it so much faster, so much. Easier. Absolutely, and I think cost cost is always a factor um in, in in commercial sense so if you can if you can eliminate some of that including the photographer <laughs> then it'll probably be done if 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 the agency can you know create create the images through through strokes of keys then yeah why why do you need to pay a photographer but it's it's certainly changed in that respect and i think it's i mean photography commercially for us anyways it's, it's it's a tough business at the moment because it is it, you're constantly battling cost because because of this uh, saturated market as such so i think this is just another hurdle to sort of yeah just to, to climb over yeah for sure no it's interesting i don't totally understand the people that like create ai images and then post them up on Instagram or whatever without any description or anything like that. And it's people who like used to be known as photographers. Cause then it's like, okay, you know, everyone thinks you're a photographer. That's why they're following you. And then they see this image that you've put up and they're probably going to assume that it was a photograph. And so they're going to be like, Holy smokes. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. How did you do that? And it's like, Oh, I, typed some prompts into this keyboard and and made a few tweaks to it in Photoshop and that's how it got made and it's yeah it's interesting I don't I don't totally understand that 
from an ethical perspective um yeah i think as, it, well, as well it removes it removes the pleasure while we uh, go out to take pictures as well isn't it i think if you're a photographer then sh the main enjoyment is to be out capturing photographs in reality so yeah it's a, it's a strange to to then start producing ai and saying that it's that it is photography um yeah I'm not sure about yeah. that one yeah i agree i'm glad i'm glad someone else agrees with me <laughs> it's it's a, it's a device it's another divisive subject isn't it at the moment in in photography um but I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't stop us from, from enjoying what we do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think it necessarily affects me in terms of how I make photos or anything like that. But I don't know. It always just bothers me when people are being inauthentic or they're deceptive on purpose for whatever reason, personal gain or popularity or likes or comments or whatever. It's I've never had... I've never held that type of behavior in high regard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, shifting gears again. So do you see uh, major differences between the United Kingdom and other parts of the world in terms of landscape photography and how it is sold, how it's talked about and how it's commercialized? And if so, I'm curious, what do you suppose those differences are? I think generally, I think not really no i think um i think the ultimate difference is is terrain um from from certainly from the uk to the to the us um but in terms of how things are sort of sold commercially i don't i don't think so i think there are a lot more youtube channels in the uk perhaps <laughs> i don't know why why it's not why it doesn't seem to take off so much in america but i think i think in the uk you seem to need to have a have a youtube channel perhaps but um i've got great respect for anybody that does because i certainly couldn't manage the two things at once i think it's it must be a tough a tough uh a tough problem to sort of juggle juggle the two i think i would miss way too many pictures in, in trying to capture video at the same time no. yeah have you got thoughts on the differences do you, do you see any differences from from looking back the other way yeah no I, I i hadn't pieced this together until you were talking about it but you know from what i understand there's not a huge print market in the uk like people don't buy a ton of prints i mean i know there are people no. that do buy prints but it's not the same as is here in the united states so that's one thing um and then i'm 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 not totally sure if this is true or not but it seems like there's not quite as much workshop culture in the uk in terms of like lots and lots of people running workshops or i could be wrong about that but um so i'm wondering because i you kind of beat me to the punch because i was going to ask you why the heck are there so many damn youtubers in the <laughs> uk and now i'm starting to think well maybe that's because from a commercial viability perspective it's it's one of the few paths that you can actually take that's available to in in terms of making a living yeah 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 definitely i think is is it quite a big print is it quite a big print print market then in, in the us well i think it's i mean do you guys have like art shows and art fairs and stuff like that over there where you can yeah. like show up in a show up in your sprinter van with like 40 metal prints and you sell them they, they happen but yeah it's not particularly pop that popular certainly where i live i think which is it's a real shame because i'd like this there's no better way to see an image than than printed and hanging on a wall and yeah 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 it, it, it would be an amazing thing to have more galleries definitely and then and then that might translate you know in, into print sales i think there isn't the appetite or it doesn't seem like there is the appetite for print sales in this country which is disappointing because it is a great way to view it view work i mean i went, I went to see joe cornish's and simon baxter's exhibition um and the, the quality when you see the those images up close is is absolutely phenomenal it's and yeah, I wish I wish that would be more prominent um, and have more opportunity in that to see other people's work more than anything else. Because I think there's yeah, there's no better way than than viewing photography if you enjoy and, and you love this craft 
than seeing it up close in print definitely yeah i agree um, i think workshops wise it is it's difficult because there seem to be quite a few people offering workshops um so that's probably another way to do it and i think sometimes it can feel it can feel a bit like a saturated market but is, is that something in america then that is is popular is, oh, could that be down to yeah it's very very popular location? yeah very 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 popular i mean basically over here it seems like if someone's been in photography for more than six months they're offering workshops yeah <laughs> it is a, it, 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 i guess it is a trend and there is a danger of yeah somebody who starts a youtube channel then six months later starts offering workshops maybe with you know without the experience i don't know i'm, I'm not sure if, you know yeah and it's maybe that maybe that is i don't know I, I do think that it seems like there's a lot more U youtubers in the uk though that's yeah it's, it's a strange one i'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure why that is it's i think it is probably to yeah so so you can gain, gain a, a more of your reputation i don't know it's it is hugely popular youtube yeah. over here and there's certainly some some decent um work being shown um but it's definitely grown massively in the last five years yeah tremendously yeah well, all right so i got one more question for you matt uh who do you recommend for the podcast? well i think you've had you've had one of my recommendations on recently is obviously is joe cornish um so so that was uh, that was an int very interesting listen um there's another guy called again this is just just finding through social media which is one of the you know one of the bonuses is Ange uh, angelo jesus another woodland photographer some 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 beautiful work also i'm a big admirer of uh, van der ravelska's work it's very quiet um sort of subtle subdued uh, images really 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 beautiful and finally um lizzie shepherd i've fo followed for quite some time again very very tastefully presented work i don't think lizzie's ever produced a bad image that i've seen it's absolutely gorgeous work so i would certainly uh recommend recommend any of those three uh, love photographers it. love it love it and did you have anything that you wanted to plug for yourself um we're ha having um a joint exhibition in december uh at the end of this year uh just in a local area in drumfield so yeah if anybody is open to looking at some printed work which is uh, <laughs> which which will be great it's my first time sort of sort of showing any work so I'll, the whole process has been quite interesting in terms of selection uh, mm -hmm. and looking at print types so yeah so yeah that's so that'll be happening in uh, december that's cool to have that opportunity we don't have a lot of that here where i live i live in a pretty small sit town so there used to be a photography gallery here that was um it was open so it was called open shutter and it was basically anyone could i mean not anyone but it wasn't like just one person's work it was they would do shows and but they closed of course so um yeah, that's shame, too bad it? it was like and it was like three months after i moved here <laughs> <laughs> of course fate yeah. yeah i think it's it's i mean i guess it's so expensive now to to have property uh, and have an office space to do it so I think until that changes that it might be restricted I don't know which is, which is a real shame yeah well Matt this has been fun and of course it's always good to have another Matt on the show so. yes Matt thank you Matt well thank you to Matt for the great chat today about your journey in photography I really enjoy your work and I hope to see more of it soon if you're a UK listener I highly encourage you to check out Matt's work in person in December of 2023 at the Drawnfield Barn. Matt will also be releasing a ebook soon on his website, which is linked in the show notes. So please help me support him by giving his site a view. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.